Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the first Sunday of Christmas, which falls on December 31, 2023, also Happy New Year, are Isaiah 61, verse 10 through 62, verse 3, Psalm 148, Galatians 4, 4 through 7, and Luke 2, 22 through 40. So here's the thing, like, it ha- Merry Christmas still, but also Happy New Year. And uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. There we go. Yes. Um, happy yeah. New Year. There's the fireworks. And that's all a right. real treat. That's, <laughs> well that's going to get people watching but, us on YouTube. If you're only doing audio, you just missed the show. You did. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Anyway, but it is really still Christmas, and that's what we will focus on. Yes, yes, it, yeah. So Luke twenty, uh, Luke two, twenty-two through forty, Jesus is presented in the temple, and uh, where did you both land with this unique passage? You know, I always love this text, particularly ever since I realized that Luke always does these pairings. Um, uh, choosing the one that you don't think. Um, and so in this particular uh, um, in this particular episode, that's the word that I'm looking for, um, we we will have Anna, who's a prophet, and we will have Simeon. And uh, I think that it's just a beautiful reminder that we're going to hear this story told and God is going to show up. And God is going to truly show up for everyone and that God is going to show up to answer um, the long um, request, long offered request um, that God hears, that God sees and that God responds. And so um, I I just I love the um, specificity here of, of, you know, I've asked for this and um, I'm okay, God. I've seen, I've seen your promise fulfilled. And, and then it moves on to, um, to a prophet who is Anna. And um, she's going to uh, confirm, I guess, uh, that this promise is fulfilled. I just love Luke for doing that. And that's where, I I would tell that story with that focus of particularly if you took the the shepherd story um, or the shepherd's focus um, last week, you can continue that uh, as you move through Luke. Yeah, the, the I, I almost hesitate to say this because everybody's going to focus on Simeon and Anna, and you should because they're such a beautiful part of the story. I think I've said before, Luke one and two. If I could only have two chapters of the entire Bible, these would be it. And I, I've, I'm sure I stole this from a book or from a teacher, but I always say it, right? it. Jesus comes to a world with people who are eagerly longing for God's fulfillment to come to pass. And Simeon and Anna both enfleshed that in beautiful ways. But, <laughs> or and, should say. And, and. <laughs> And uh, I want to note, too, just the whole notion of this ritual of purification, which probably doesn't land softly in a lot of modern ears. Like, pur- purification? What do they mean, purification? I mean, it makes it sound like there's something, right, inherently, uh, what, bad about childbirth or something like that. And so what they go through here is essentially uh, a Leviticus ritual. I think it's Leviticus 12 That's that's you know, might need some explanation if people want to talk about that in terms of like what's being cleansed here or or things like that. But maybe more important is just to stop and say, Luke wants us to notice just how Jewish this family is. In other words, don't assume that the birth of Jesus is an end to Judaism or is somehow an off-ramp away from Judaism, but he's going to be raised thoroughly enmeshed in not just the demands of the law, I would not use that word, but the power of the law and the promise of the law and what that means for 
him when he grows and becomes a teacher and a healer and an exorcist and even a um, a combatant with other uh, with other teachers. And to hold on to that with uh, sorry, Caroline. Uh, no, uh, to hold on to that with the fact that uh, the Levitical code um, was not everyone, and it it highlights Jesus' uh, particular lineage and particular call, and um, I, I think that's worth noting as well. Um, that um, unclean is not sin. Correct. Uh, you know, and and so so if you if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, take advantage of the opportunity to correct some of those misreadings, um, because the gift that I find in Leviticus is the fact that it's in the Levitical code that we learn all the things that Jesus is going to do. The feeding the hungry, the you know, it's not just that Isaiah text when he does his first sermon. Yeah, here he's purified in the Levitical way and. He's going to live that out. You can make a case, I think, that Jesus and Mary have both undergone something very risky, but also very holy. And so part of the ritual is to mark that and to name that. Mm -hmm. I think, too, the I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll uh, piggyback on that on that holiness piece. And then I'm going to take us back to Simeon and Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, but one of the things that's so interesting about the holiness of this moment is is the prominence of or the the presence of the Holy Spirit in all of mm. this, which is a major theme in Luke. But mm. uh, but that you know had been real revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Spirit, and so you just have this sense that. Yes, this is a following of the uh, following of the law, which is deeply connected to uh, to the divine and holiness of a relationship with God. And so you have that presence of the spirit that is reinforcing that uh, and that is pointing us in that direction. And I think that that's uh, that's important. I I am going to take us back to Simeon and Anna because I find like you were talking about joy i find the presence of both of them in this passage so homiletically inviting and rich in that one one has something to say and one has a ton to say but you never hear what she says and and so you have simeon's words that uh, that are one response right to this encounter this meeting of this of of the messiah and and the way in which, you know, the nuke diminished, which I think is one of the most beautiful passages in scripture ever, <laughs> and and it, it invites that it invites that moment of of you know of fulfillment, right? That your that that your life has been fulfilled in this in this moment in this promise being fulfilled by God. I mentioned uh, for Christmas Eve, I this particular Christmas is a little bit uh, difficult for me with my dad. And I was just thinking like um, that this passage, I, I just imagine this being on the lips of my dad mm -hmm. um, when he was dying. I mean, he didn't actually say that, but but I could really hear that here. And, and, and particularly some things I've run across uh, in some of my recent paperwork that I've had to do for him, uh, where he was, uh, he had a massive heart attack in 94 and in 98, I found out, and I don't know if I remember that. I don't know if he ever told me this, but he applied for a heart transplant and the doc, the cardiologist said, well, you're just, you're just right above the level. So you don't, you don't qualify for a heart transplant. And then the next line was, uh, but your cardiac function is such that you have several good years ahead of you. And he got 24. <laughs> wow. And so I just, I, that all came to mind in those words of, of, of what, of what Christmas means. And then with Anna, what's so, I think that what that invites us is that, you know, she's embodying all the, the, the responses that we see throughout Luke, a, a Luke of praise and worship and 
ongoing prayer. And, and so I think what that does here is it invites our response, right? Like what, 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 what will be our praise? What will be our worship? What will be our prayer? Uh, because we have, uh, because we have met, met the goodness of God and Jesus in this moment. And so to invite people to imagine what would they say? Uh, what will be their words of praise? What will be their words of worship? What will be their words of prayer? Uh, that, uh, that, that Anna's not, Anna's no words, but her embodied action of response invites us into. In some ways, if I can, and we can go back, but um, that's a perfect segue into Isaiah 61 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, I will not be silent. And um, if, I, um, if, if I take that turn back uh, to, to Luke, um, every once in a while, well, I'll do it this way, um, Caroline. Uh, th- this is the fifth uh, Christmas for me without my mom, mm-hmm. and um, I remember saying to one of my students that um, when you're making the church uh, contemporary, don't lose the older folks who have been in that church for generations. And one of the things that happens for me in this text is that both Anna and Simeon are older. And so in this season where we celebrate with mm-hmm. so much of sharing the story and enacting the story with the children, um, make sure the grandparents know that, and now I'm going to go back to Isaiah, that they still have a word of witness to offer. Mm-hmm. And they must continue to offer this word until all the nations have heard. And that uh, the vindication is, um, is of God is made clear, not of us. Such a beautiful oracle <clears throat> with the uh, just the way it expresses value, uh, value in God. Oracle. Uh, pardon me, I'm sorry. Oracle. You said oracle. I did say oracle. <laughs> I'm should sorry. I not, should I not have said no. oracle? It's like it was like you just. That, that, that's a great. That's a great word. Uh, if I okay, in the end, I was looking at the uh, royal diadem, and I didn't say that, and so my head was like, "You could have gone there." He just said oracle, and it fell out of my mouth. <laughs> okay, I'm so okay. confused right now. I don't think I understand <clears throat> anything, or I don't even know what song you're humming. But oh, at uh. The Great. royal diadem and crown him. Oh, sure. Lord of all. Yeah. Yeah, okay. but here you're the actual diadem in the hand of your God. So I, it's. Uh, oh yeah, it's, that's. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, too much eggnog for all of us, but I think it's. Um, <laughs> I love eggnog. Oh. I think it's. Uh, I do too. I, okay, I'm sorry, Matt. You were no, going no, to tell us what oracle this was, it's and. All good. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, Isaiah. Correct. Isaiah. <laughs> this oracle, this poem, these words coming from the Isaiah prophet guy are, uh, um, they, they express this deep value in the eyes of God, right? This idea of being clothed with the garments of salvation, all these things, right? Decked out with a garland and being adorned with jewels. So this gets to the, uh, you know, what kind of in this season, what kind of value does Christmas express toward humanity, right? How is Christmas God's way of saying, this is how much you mean to me? Mm. Which, you know, uh, soon we're going to be talking about Lent and John the Baptist is going to come on the scene. There's going to be warnings. But but Christmas is also, or the incarnation, I would rather say, is also an expression of how deeply God values humanity as a whole, like in the abstract, but each individual person as well. And Mm -hmm. this gives us some language for that. Mm -hmm. When we talked last uh, last week uh, in terms of, okay, I went blank on what the word was that we use, uh, but- Oracle. um, (laughs) Well, what I want to come back to is what you noted is that, um, oh, I know what it is. Uh, We talked last week about how this is God's continual act to reconcile the world, that God has been about this work um, since the fall. And you noted, uh, Matt, that the uh, that we are the royal diadem in the, in the hand. So um, the idea of what it means to be human that God is holding to is mm-hmm. that 
God has not given up on the fact that we have been created as the creator's icon, as the image bearer of God. God hasn't given up on that. And this beautiful word um, acknowledges that. And the incarnation is proof that that God God is doing that in the flesh. You are all saying, uh, you both are saying very theological, meaningful uh, things about this passage, and I agree with all of them. I'm just kind of stuck on the garland and the, um, because we all still have that, or at least I do, and you know, my house is still decorated, but it also made me think about like, I don't know, it made me think about like that the way in which that the the way in which we surround ourselves with the adornments and the garments and the robes and the garland and the jewels is um, not just decorating for Christmas, but it's a way of praising. Um, I don't know. I I I love decorating for the holidays. Like I have fall decorations and I have my Christmas decorations, and I have Easter decorations. But I don't know. It's it's a way of thinking that yeah, all of this is about this celebration and um, giving, giving praise to God in this for what God has done. So anyway, that's far less theological, mean, theologically meaningful. No. And Isaiah well, left out the pine cones as well. The pine <laughs> cones. Yes. The pine cones here. Like I've got a pine cone. My pine cone. Is it over there? Yeah. Where's my pine cone. <laughs> Where's the mint? There should be a mint. My pine cone. Oh, and I have pine cones here. Look at all my pine cones. Yeah. Right. There should be a striped mint candy hanging. Okay. <laughs> all right. Moving right along. 148. But, you know, but, 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 you know, just, just to make a, a theological uh, tie to that, Caroline, because it is the praise, but it also is just as committed as you are to making sure that um, these seasons are, um, are, recognize demonstrably recognized that's what god is committed to mm-hmm. that in the flesh humanity would demonstratively be what we were created to be mm-hmm. the yeah. goodness of god on earth yeah like that. yeah okay now we can move on okay psalm 148 here's my suggestion for preachers out there there are so many hymns that are based on psalm 148 like yeah. So many. All you have to do is go to hymnary.org. There's, uh, there is all things bright and beautiful. There is praise God from whom all blessings flow. There's for the beauty of the earth, all creatures of our God and King. And so sing this Psalm for all it's worth. Uh, and I don't know how you can read this and not sing. So don't don't read it. That's what I'm saying right now. Do not read this psalm because it's praise, 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 praise. So sing it. Find a way to sing it. That's- and if you were singing a couple of weeks back, this will continue that idea. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's my thought on Psalm 148. Yeah. I'm lots not going to miss that. I love lots that. Lots of hymns out there. It's yes. easy, easy to find. Easy, easy. Galatians 4, 4 through 7, on Christmas, the first Sunday of Christmas. Paul likes to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is about as Christmassy as Paul gets. (laughs) Born of a woman (laughs) under the law. Yeah, That is true, isn't it? I had had no... That's the Christmas story, according to Paul. Born of a woman under the law. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Let's move on here now, is what he's saying. But (laughs) He gets the praise in. Oh yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not criticizing Paul here, but um, no, I hadn't thought about that. You're exactly right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, praise in there, but this notion of adoption and that adoption causes us to cry out to God as, uh, in this case, as a as a father. As and for Paul, that's also a sign of the Spirit. The Spirit enables us to do that. So Paul, we talked. In one of our Christmassy podcasts about telescoping, that you know, from the particularity of of this birth in Bethlehem to the cosmic implications of it, and Paul is pointing us in that direction. If that's where you want to go on this second Sunday of Christmas, first Sunday of Christmas. So, Mm -hmm. anyway, a lot in Galatians. What do you want to say about Galatians? Well, I verse four. I think I would just I, I would sit on the word fullness of time. 
had come. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in particular, you know, just what, uh, what the, what fullness means, um, and, and, you know, the way that you can imagine what it, how is Christmas, the, or how is the birth of Jesus, the fullness of time? There are a number of ways you can translate it, uh, translate that too. But, uh, but that's, that's what really strikes me with this passage is, is what does it mean that the fullness, that Christmas is the fullness of time and really helping, uh, exploring that imaginatively and metaphorically. That's what I would, which is a beautiful way to say what Christmas is. And I'd go back um, in that same sense of the power of what it means to um, become siblings. I mean, there is a, a sense of belonging. And, and I say that as a person who was adopted um, into a, a marvelous family, um, though I didn't have siblings. I was I was a tough enough uh, firstborn that my parents were like, oh, okay, we won't do that again. But <laughs> but it made, made, made my life great to belong. And uh, so uh, this idea of, of what it, I mean, the difficulty of the language of, of slave, um, whether you take that in terms of all of its um, uh, trauma, or if you simply take it uh, as a lightweight idea of what it means to belong to a company, to be employed, not the same as belonging in a family. And I think that that's a rich word that uh, Paul gives us uh, to recognize that the incarnation is about becoming siblings in Christ. <laughs>